I think the most critical issue in our society. In October of 2002, our Congress overwhelmingly voted to give the President the right to go to war when he wanted to on his and his decision alone, including the use of nuclear weapons. James Madison, easily the most important author of our Constitution, said that the clause in the Constitution reserving the right to go to war to the elected representatives of the people is the single most important clause in the Constitution. Never, ever should such a power be entrusted to a single man. In October of 2002, our Congress, both parties, kissed off the Constitution. And that's the issue today, uh, more, almost more than anything else. I was, when I, I began to write this in my book called uh, The Sorrows of Empire, I was, I was saying that the history would suggest to us we may begin to see in America a military populist, one who comes along, who begins to represent our legions deployed on our 725 military bases around the world, but who are not very well paid, who are not very well taken care of, whose families are often destitute in terms of, uh, of uh, trying to lead normal lives, uh, but that who are intensely patriotic and, and identified with the United States, that we're waiting for the militarists to come along and say, I, uh, I will uh, serve your interests against those of vested interests in the United States. All I require is dictatorship. Two weeks after I wrote that, General Clark entered the race. And I thought, oh my God, this is happening a lot faster than I thought it was going to. I thought, that is, between the death of Julius Caesar and, uh, the, and uh, the Battle of Actium and, and Octavian's emergence as the now unquestioned dictator of Rome, uh, took about, uh, about 25 years. Uh, ours is coming along at the speed of FedEx, I'm afraid. Uh, it's, uh, the uh, it, history is a little bit faster today than it used to be. But that's to say, uh, that's what's at stake today. Perhaps our most prominent political philosopher in this country in the post-war period, Hannah Arendt, once made the case in Origins of Totalitarianism that tyranny can always prevail over others because it doesn't require consent. Its only cost is the destruction of its own society. That's, in many ways, what our militarism, the unintended consequence of what it's doing, is to destroy our constitutional order. Indeed, militarism is very highly advanced today, and we should bear in mind probably the two most famous generals who were ever presidents of the United States, namely George Washington and Dwight Eisenhower, both in their farewell addresses famously uh, warned us about it. That is, uh, Washington warned of the, uh, the extreme dangers, as he said, to Republican liberty of standing armies and what these lead to. Eisenhower, even more famously, in his farewell address in 1961, invented the phrase military-industrial complex. We know today that he intended to say military-industrial-congressional complex, but was warned off by his advisors that that's asking for trouble but he spoke of the rise of unauthorized power in our society uh, and its, uh, the, uh, the tendency to distort our, uh, our Republican form of government. I believe this distortion is now so far advanced that it is truly an open question whether you could reverse it under any such circumstances, which is it's something that we were talking about earlier that leads to uh, this is speculation. It's not a prediction. I'm not, I'm not Cassandra, though the important thing about Cassandra is that she was right. <laughs> there was something funny in that horse. Uh, and, and Greeks bearing gifts should be looked at very closely. Uh, the, uh, she's one of the few social scientists that ever got it right. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, without being Cassandra, what fear, I fear at times that we seem to be treading the same steps as the former Soviet Union. Uh, we now know with precision and from ample sources inside Russia of the things that brought the Soviet Union down. It had absolutely nothing to do with Ronald Reagan or Star Wars. They had been thoroughly warned off on that and understood how easily uh, a so-called missile defense system can be defeated through decoys and things of this sort. Sakharov was brought out of internal exile in uh, Gorky in order to address the Politburo on that subject, and he said don't spend a nickel on it. 
The Soviet Union was brought down by three things, all three of which strike me as parallel in America at, in the first years of the, uh, of the 21st century. First, uh, extreme economic rigidity driven by ideology. That is the inability to reform our economic institutions in ways that need to be done because of the power of ideology. It was Marxism-Leninism in the case of Russia that prevented uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev from being able to improve Russian efficiency. In our society, we see it in the whole world of corporate corruption, uh, the belief that the stock exchange is no longer a functioning market but is in fact a club of crooks, uh, the uh, ripping off of uh, workers' pension funds, the uh, uh, savaging of corporate profits by inside uh, executives, as in the case of Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, uh, whatever else you may want to say. The second, uh, imperial overstretch. Now this is where the issue that just came up, the fact that you get over time playing the imperial role just as Rome, as the Roman Republic did. You get too many commitments and you start making too many enemies. Uh, there's too many cases of blowback out there. We, I mean, I could begin to tick off for you or put it a different way. On 9-11, my publisher in New York called me uh, shortly after uh, she had heard of the explosions. Her office is on West 18th Street, which is getting reasonably close to ground zero, and said, blowback, big time, just hit. And I'm getting out of here, but you ought to turn on the TV. Uh, one of the things we speculated on, though, is, well, who are the terrorists? We didn't automatically think that they were uh, from the Islamic world. They could just as easily have been from Chile, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Ecuador, as a result of uh, Operation Condor and uh, the things that we had done there. They could have been from East Timor. They could have been from Indonesia. They could have been from... Uh, uh, Okinawa. They could have been Greeks. After all, Greece, together with South Korea, are probably the two most anti-American democracies on earth today. In the case of Greece, is what they remember between 1967 and 1974, the Greek colonels put in power by the Central Intelligence Agency and probably the most repressive government supported by either side in the Cold War. Uh, something that no Greek is going to forget. I warn American citizens about that since the Olympic Games are going to be held in Athens next year. Uh, I, the Greeks are certainly thinking about it. If I were an American tourist, I'd think about it too. Uh, that, uh, well, see, if you have an alternative passport, it wouldn't be bad to use it if you happen to have a Mexican one or a Brazilian one or something like that. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, and then the third, it's, it's just to say that imperial overstretch, ex put the Soviet Union in, into a, uh, a situation approaching uh, uh, fiscal insolvency. There were simply too many commitments. We now have, uh, the Department of Defense acknowledges well over 700 American military bases in other people's countries. Uh, this is at the same time not to mention another 300 that are at least secret, uh, that are kept totally secret. The intelligence bases uh, many of the bases that we simply don't acknowledge we have, like Bon Steel and Kosovo and, and places like that. Um, the bases in Great Britain that are disguised as Royal Air Force bases. Any number of, of installations that we don't want to publicly disclose are uh, functioning American uh, military bases. Uh, imperial overstretch, that is, it's, it, imperialism is a little bit like the saber-toothed tiger. Evolution doesn't work backwards. Bunch of, or <clears throat> I often think about, many of you will remember in Watergate that um, uh, Nixon's chief of staff, uh, Haldeman, one day denounced John Dean uh, for speaking too freely about uh, the felonies committed by the president uh, in Congress. And he said, John, you know, once you've squeezed all the toothpaste out of the tube, it's very hard to get it back in. Well, that's it's a homely metaphor by a man who went to prison and a former advertising executive. But in a certain sense, that's the United States today. That's the imperial overstretch. You begin to squeeze too much out and too many commitments, too many other places, and you can't reverse it. The third the thing that brought down the Soviet Union was the inability to reform. Uh, and there it is an interesting fact that as a professor of international relations, we normally teach our students there are no known cases of 
empires that, uh, that went quietly, that didn't resist their own demise, that, that didn't fight at the end. One of the few exceptions you might make is probably the Soviet Empire in that Mikhail Gorbachev was trying very hard at the end to reverse the Russian Empire. He was quite ready to kiss off the, the satellites in East Europe, including uh, East Germany, because he wanted better relations with France and Germany and he also, he and his people had begun to identify Russia as a European country and they wanted to dismantle the Stalinist system. Nonetheless, he was stopped by vested interests in the, in the Cold War system, in the Soviet system as structured, just as I believe today anyone in America who attempted serious reform will then run into unimaginable vested interests. I mean, we see it every time. I mean, I don't particularly like Donald Rumsfeld as uh, Secretary of Defense, but I agree with him on the need to close bases. We have 6,000 military bases in the United States alone. Uh, he has said he'd like to close a quarter of the Army bases and a third of the air bases. I tell you, that every time he even opens his mouth like that, you get a firestorm on Capitol Hill from extremely liberal senators. I mean, the senators from California, from Washington, etc., saying, oh my God, you can't close bases in my state. We, uh, our people work there. We, uh, they make a living making uh, uh, depleted uranium munitions, uh, uh, multiple megaton atom bombs. These are lovely little jobs that we'd like to keep. Those are vested interests. Those are serious vested interests that I don't easily see how they would be uh, defeated except by uh, a totally unforeseen renaissance of the American public re regaining their civic consciousness, retaking control of the country. There are the slightest signs of this. I mean, I, I still believe, I didn't anticipate, I don't know of anybody else who did, the remarkable power and influence of the coalition that came together in Seattle in November of 1999 against the World Trade Organization, the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. This was an amazing development that despite being absolutely savaged by the, uh, uh, the mainstream press in America as hooligans, anarchists, and everything else, they had of course finally discovered that the uh, the worm in globalization is that the IMF, the WTO, uh, and the World Bank are probably the most undemocratic, fake institutions that exist on Earth. They are dominated by the U.S. Treasury. They're located within hailing at 1818 H Street, within hailing distance of the Treasury. We run them, but that we run them in a covert way, as if they were international organizations. Um, that movement then spread around the world and is today enormously influential and led to just before the American invasion of Iraq evidence that in every democracy on earth where people could express public opinion, public opinion was around 80% against the United States. And it didn't mean that the government, Mr. Asnar in Spain or, or Berlusconi in Italy or uh, the poodle uh, Blair in England were going to listen to their people. They just taught democracy. But the public was aroused, was mobilized, was sensitized. Should that continue? Uh, should the public continue to educate itself via the internet and things like that? One could imagine a, uh, a renaissance in America. Barring that, I fear, like the Soviet Union from 1989 to 1999, uh, we are a nemesis, the goddess of vengeance, the goddess of the punisher of, uh, of hubris and arrogance, awaits her meeting with us uh, and awaits rather impatiently. It's, um, and it is fairly late in the day. So let's assume that there's still a last minute rescue possible. What would the elements of that be? What would an enlightened populace taking charge do? One could speculate in many different ways on it, but the most obvious things are that it would require a reform of Congress, uh, a reform of the corrupted election laws, 
it would very possibly require almost a, re, an, a redivision of, of the basic states, which turned out to be gerrymanders. I mean, after all, North Dakota has fewer people in it than Chula Vista, California. Uh, it's, this is a, uh, it's an odd thing to live with, to have to live with, uh, with the world of, uh, of electoral votes rather than, rather than where the population actually lives and what the population a actually thinks. They would then have to retake Congress and, uh, and use the powers given to Congress in the Constitution to begin to cut off money to the intelligence agencies and to the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is not a Department of Defense. It's an alternative source of government on the south bank of the Potomac River that is increasingly expanding into numerous activities well beyond what was ever imagined as, uh, as the, uh, the military. What would, would the people do about the, the military petroleum complex? Well, obviously that needs to be brought under control. That is to say, I mean, in one sense, the problem of the military petroleum complex is going to solve itself because we're going to run out of world petroleum. I mean, that we're, we're now using it in such a profligate manner. I mean, that we actually, people in our society, including the governor of California, take pride in driving around in automobiles that use fuel the way a tank does, uh, namely the, the General Motors Hummer. Uh, the, uh, uh, we are going to run out of it. They're just, it, it, it's a finite amount. Moreover, there are huge competitive interests today that are prepared to use petroleum in a much more efficient way than we do, but that nonetheless want their share, or do not wish to see it all destroyed by profligate uh, use in North America, also with the uh, huge uh, uh, production of greenhouse gases in North America as a result of this dependence on, uh, on uh, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, but that in the meantime, I think the history of the Soviet Union and what happened after its demise should warn us that we will face remarkable resistance by vested interests in this system as constituted today uh, because the money involved, the jobs involved, the uh, uh, structures of life that we have been led to believe are indispensable to our very identity, such as the automobile, uh, the automobile as, as we drive it here in Southern California, where you drive home every night into unimaginable traffic jams with a single person sitting in an automobile that could carry 10. Uh, it, and, 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 you, and that's, I'm not exaggerating, that's right next to you everywhere you go. Uh, the, uh, this could be changed, obviously, but what, what is history would suggest that it was more likely to lead to conflict, but that conflicts that we are very likely now to lose. It's nowhere written that the United States must go on forever as uh, the hegemon dominating the rest of the world. As, it, as I say, history does seem to be speeded up. If we were carrying on this conversation, say in 1985, and I had said to you that within five years, the Soviet Union will disappear. You would have thought, this guy is inhaling too deeply on something grown around the Berkeley campus. Uh, this is not a reliable source of information. I am here to tell you, like uh, Nabokov talking about Gogol, it's gone. That is, Russia is not the Soviet Union. It's got a GNP about the size of the Netherlands. It, the place came right apart between 1991 and, I mean, 1989 and 1991, when they made the famous decision not to resist the Germans' desire to tear down the Berlin Wall, and that then this led into something that we in the United States could not possibly stand, what uh, Gorbachev uh, instituted, Glasnost, opening the prisons, letting everybody out of Guantanamo, uh, and opening the archives revealing all the black operations of the CIA. The Russian people became so horrified once the details of the gulags were brought home to them. I mean, Solzhenitsyn had already started to introduce it, but when they began to understand the horrors of the Stalinist system, they tore the place apart. And everybody who could got out, went independent, created an independent, 
we'd have an independent Texas if you'd, uh, uh, now that would not necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the point here is to say these things happen suddenly, much more fast than you may believe, uh, that we are not well warned, that is a $28 billion Central Intelligence Agency whose primary function was to study the Soviet Union throughout the 1980s didn't notice that the place was coming apart economically. Now, I agree with Senator Moynihan there. This is, an, this is an, a place to save $28 billion, I would have thought. It would have been better not to have had it than to listen to their lunatic overstatements of the threat of the Soviet Navy, the threat of, uh, of uh, Soviet weapons, of uh, strategic weapons, uh, of how we were going to uh, break their back economically with, with Ronnie Baby Star Wars and things of this sort. None of that happened, that the Soviet Union came apart because, for the same reason that most empires do come apart. And I'm here to argue that we're not invulnerable. That is to say, Americans often argue with me things like, are you trying to say that our decline is inevitable? I am not saying that. I am saying I cannot imagine the evidence for the opposite point of view. I cannot imagine what evidence one would produce to say, we go on forever now. We are like Apollo. Uh, we are no longer subject to, uh, to the cycles of decay and of overstretch and of hubris uh, that are so palpably apparent in our ideology, in our people, in our uh, uh, flag-waving patriotism, uh, and our lack of knowledge of as elemental things as the Constitution. I mean, under Attorney General Ashcroft, two articles of the Bill of Rights are now dead letters, four and six, that is, on uh, 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 freedom from intrusion into your home and habeas corpus, that is, the, the, uh, the demand that the government must produce charges against you uh, and uh, allow you to defend yourself, give you expert legal advice in defending yourself, confront witnesses against you. Uh, we have, the president has now uh, arrogated to himself the uh, power to declare somebody to be, quote, a bad guy. And a bad guy he can throw into a naval prison in Charleston, South Carolina, and throw the key away. Uh, it, it, this is not what Article 6 says the president gets to do. Uh, and yet the American public tolerates it. That's one of the issues that would come up into this question of can you imagine a reversal? Because the, uh, what would be required in this reversal is a change in the level and quality of information available to the public. They clearly are wildly misled today by a propaganda apparatus that is associated with the entertainment industry. I mean, that dominates it for commercial and uh, commercial reasons, commercial profit, uh, from uh, Fox News to uh, uh, Verizon's control of CBS, GE's control of NBC, Disney's control of ABC. Uh, there's hardly a word put out on it that you can believe. And if you actually know something about the subject before you hear it, you know what you just heard was not true. Uh, the, it happens all the time, or the happy news that follows after the first 15 minutes. It, it's quite literally like listening to Pravda. I traveled in, in Russia extensively at the height of the Brezhnev era in 1978, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it is, and as the Russians used to say, no one reads Pravda to get the news. You read Pravda to get the line. You get the news from people you trust, from your own little radio, uh, from some ways that, from uh, messages that friends transmit to you. Uh, I no longer read the New York Times for the news. I read it for the line. Uh, it's, and, and I think we've all sort of gotten used to that. Uh, now then, how could this, what is changing? I mean, the, the public opinion polls tell us that in the United States it breaks down about 70-30. About 70% of the public is behind the president, behind imperialism, behind the army. They have some doubts, they're worried. They don't like their boys being killed for uh, the sake of George Bush's re-election or for the oil empire, but they're not ready to alter that. 
30% of the public is on the other side. They believe we're heading in the wrong direction and heading there very rapidly and are worried about it. What do those 30% have? Well, they've got the internet, first of all. They're reading British newspapers, uh, which they're reading The Independent and The Guardian, and that gives them a funny perspective on the world as far as the Pentagon is concerned. They've got The Nation magazine, and they've got Paul Krugman. Uh, that's about it. I mean, that's, that's, that's about, but that's enough. 30% is a, is a very large number uh, in, for our society. Uh, but one of the things that would be required would be a, uh, a vast change in the kind of information available, since uh, we now know that one of the most extraordinary sources of political power is control of the mass media in our society. That one of the things that, that was used to bring about the revolt against uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela in April of last year, April 2002, was there are uh, something like a half a dozen television stations in, uh, in Venezuela. Five are owned by private interests that devoted themselves to the destruction of the government, and only one was in the hands of the president who was able to put out a different point of view. Uh, I can't say that there's anything in the United States today that is putting out a different point of view in, in terms of the mass media uh, from that of, uh, of sort of the approved and uh, copycat uh, journalism of the, uh, of the uh, uh, networks, except of course for the Fox News, which represents an Australian fascist. And, and they put out a line that is fairly consistently uh, off over in one particular uh, corner. I mean Rupert Murdoch, of course, the owner of the News Corporation, the owner of the Fox uh, uh, network, and a person who uses it for his own personal political purposes. Uh, yeah, I, I heard a, a commentator say the other day that he, what he's seeing now is the convergence of psyops mm. and news. Yes. Or media relations. Yes. Media yeah. relations. Yeah, so that there, you know. It's also a major issue in the Pentagon is to begin to develop our own news, uh, news management. I mean, yeah. that is, they've invented embedding the lovely Pentagon euphemism, embedding otherwise reputable journalists uh, with our military formations, more or less cutting them off in any real source of news, but having them to report nothing but, well, these were basically decent guys who were scared to death that they were, they were going into combat. Uh, and it, it, once you've read that story, uh, but you don't need it every day, uh, together with the power to manipulate the news in, in many, many ways, I don't think there was any more serious military lesson discovered by our militaries from the Vietnam War than the need to control the journalistic reporting. It started in Grenada where they invented the, uh, the pool system where no journalists get to actually go in. They get to be taken in by a, a lieutenant colonel and shown what they're to be shown. Mm -hmm. uh, the latest manifestation of this is, uh, is embedding. We now understand that the uh, Pentagon is in the process of creating their own television network that will broadcast their view of Iraq. Uh, that is, uh, pictures of, uh, of kindly uh, uh, young troops of the 4th Infantry Division patting kids on the head mm -hmm. and, and things of this sort. That would, uh, that would be signs that our missionaries are at work. Uh, it, of course, takes us back and reminds us again of the world of Adolf Hitler, of Lenny Riefenstahl, of uh, Joseph Goebbels, of uh, the, uh, I mean, the enormous power whether Riefenstahl, the now just recently died, late Lenny Riefenstahl, was a Nazi or not, Lord knows Adolf Hitler knew what she was capable of doing. No one, I think, will ever forget her pictures of the Nuremberg rally of 1934 with uh, Rudolf Hess in this sea of swastikas turning and saying, you know, Mein Führer Sieg Heil, and then comes forward Adolf Hitler to give one of his most incredible speeches ever. Uh, this was when we really did begin to discover the world of, not propaganda, the world of manipulation of, uh, of the public through symbols and, uh, and symbolic uh, control, which is, uh, uh, I think, we suffer from it in the United States today in an extremely advanced manner. Uh, and that is, in my view, I mean, let's put it another way. 
probably one of the most extraordinary patriots in our society today and the closest thing to sort of our version of Cicero, the most Cicero, the, the great defender of the old Republican Roman Senate, the believer in uh, the way things that should be done, the, uh, the man who uh, acquiesced in the killing by his fellow senators uh, uh, Cassius and Brutus of uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Cicero. Our Cicero is, uh, is Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia. He's out giving the most unbelievably powerful speeches in glorious rhetoric that you listen to it and of course we're reminded, we, it's, it's Roman rhetoric but it's also uh, constitutional rhetoric. It's the rhetoric of the American Founding Fathers. It's, it's a uh, rhetoric of the kinds of devices built into our society in order to protect our liberty and to prevent the development of uh, autocratic authoritarian governments associated with militarism, for example. Uh, but of course, uh, Byrd has no power and he's an old man and he comes from a poor state. Uh, so he's hardly listened to. We, the, what you really want to do is to see C-SPAN to always pan away from him and show you the totally empty Senate quarters as he's delivering one of his brilliant speeches. But Byrd, differing from me, believes that the American public simply awaits its moment of revelation of what's been going on. That once the citizen becomes well informed, begins to gather information on the degree to which uh, he is being sabotaged by our ersatz political leaders, that they will then, this citizen will rise up, retake the government, uh, will uh, uh, purify uh, the place. I would like to think he's right. I don't myself actually believe so. Uh, Sheila. Hello there, kitty cat. Come on. I'm, yes. You're going to get onto television? <laughs> come on. Come on, come here. Don't run away. Come here. Come here. This You've been on amazing. television before. This is not the most beautiful pickup you ever did. But there. There you are. You are uh, a great beauty. Hello there, beauty. This is a Russian blue. It's, those are they're not Russian cats, they're That's English it. cats. Sure. It's that, a a fixed <laughs> that used to be used on the ships to Bermats because they're the world's two. greatest Mausers. My new book is called The Sorrows of Empire. The subtitle is Militarism, Secrecy, and the End of the Republic. In the last chapter, uh, this book is mostly about our military overstretch and the complications of a volunteer army, of the fact that the military today bears no resemblance to people who remember service in the American military in World War II, or in my case in the Korean War, or in the Vietnam War, when uh, there was an obligation to serve in the armed forces uh, as a citizen. Uh, the, uh, today, people serve in the armed forces for particular individual reasons, normally to escape some dead end of American society. Uh, they do not expect to be shot at either. Uh, and once they start getting shot at, you can expect the re-enlistment rate to, uh, to reflect it. You're talking about the poverty draft? Well, no, I put it to you concretely. If you want to be a um, policeman in Atlanta, Georgia, to take the police academy test, you've got to have uh, a couple of years of college credits. One of the ways you can get around that is to be a veteran. Uh, the, uh, the second infantry division up on the DMZ in uh, Korea right now is absolutely filled full of people who joined the army in order to get those credits to go back and take the police exam. It's, it's a career planning decision, a little bit like a kid borrowing $100,000 to get his way through Stanford. Uh, you, it's, I mean, it's, this happens. I mean, when Private Jessica Lynch, uh, who got shot up at Nasseria uh, in uh, the advance on Baghdad, when she was asked, uh, why did you join the army? She says, I couldn't even get a job at Walmart in Palestine, West Virginia. I joined the army to get the hell out of Palestine, West Virginia. <coughs> I thought, ah, here comes the voice of the genuine ranks telling us what's going on in, in these things. But the, I felt at the end of this uh, book, I was obliged to say, well, what were the sorrows of empire? And I come up with four that I discuss in, uh, in some uh, great length. The first, perpetual warfare, that is the 
very <coughs> nature of our policies today, particularly preventative war uh, and uh, the breaking of virtually all international agreements and, and reciprocal agreements that we have to try and maintain peace and deal with complex problems like global warming and things of this sort. As we break these things, the obvious uh, consequence is one war after another. I mean, after all, we've had two major wars and the century has hardly started uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, both of which resulted in <coughs> what the Pentagon would like to call easy military victories, but instantaneously fell into unbelievably bloody insurgencies that can go on uh, into the end of time. Uh, the uh, uh, second uh, um, uh, sorrow of empire that I identified was the loss of civil liberties, was the, uh, the use of these crisis conditions often generated, I mean quite literally created, produced as, if you, as you would, by uh, uh, people with inside knowledge and the ability to manipulate them, uh, leads to the loss of civil liberties as the public, with some understanding, uh, is willing to forego them for the sake of trying to guarantee, at least in the short term, their immediate security, but that the rise of people like Attorney General Ashcroft and others. The, uh, the third sorrow that I identified was the uh, loss of confidence in the government because of now institutional lying based on secrecy. That is to say, Colin Powell has had a long and distinguished career as a general in the United States, including National Security Advisor to Ronald Reagan, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time of, uh, of the first Bush presidency. He totally destroyed his credibility on February 5th of 2003 by openly lying to the Security Council of the United Nations about the nature of the threat posed in Iraq and that he had sitting behind him, unavoidable in every television picture, Mr. George Tennant, the Director of Central Intelligence, as if to verify his views. He was lying and there's not a soul left on earth who cares to hear our Secretary of State speak on any subject because you can no longer trust him. This becomes part of our political culture, that we don't, that prudent people no longer believe uh, what they hear. Uh, for, I mean, that is, the uh, spokesman for the Department of Justice comes out and says, we have the, our highest priority is to maintain constitutional liberties. Well, the, obviously, anybody who's paid any attention to the United States for the last two years knows that the direct opposite is true. We are trying to figure out how to get around constitutional liberties and to uh, give greater power to the FBI and the CIA and the military uh, and to move them into our own society. I mean, we now have a, something called the Northern Command located in, uh, it's a command like CENTCOM or the Pacific Command or the European Command. We'd never created a command like that in the United States before. It was specifically avoided during the Second World War on grounds that it might become a basis for the military takeover of our government. Well, we have one now today. Uh, and uh, General Everhart, the head of Northern Command, regularly talks about how the Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the use of military force in uh, policing powers in the United States, it was enacted after the Civil War, uh, how we might have to modify that act today in order to guarantee the security of the public. I want to say, General Everhart, you don't really realize that that law was enacted to protect us not from civil disorder, but from you from people like you in this country. Uh, but the, uh, the fourth of these uh, sorrows of empire is the one that's in some ways most acute and least avoidable, and that's bankruptcy. That is, the first three are uh, the demise of America, as, as the politicians say, as we know it. Uh, they, they are uh, an alteration, uh, and, and it's a little bit like bringing the end of the Roman Republic. That didn't end Rome, it led to what uh, we like to call the Roman Empire, uh, but that, it, it, as I say, was a military dictatorship that spent most of its time trying to hold on to the world that it had conquered uh, and, uh, and slowly gave way to uh, a, a, a Christian takeover, uh, if you will, of the, uh, of the Roman uh, Republic, also, of course, a takeover by its outside enemies, uh, Roman Empire. The, uh, 
but that bankruptcy, which is today getting to be almost inevitable, instantaneously creates a crisis that nobody can control. I mean, that, it, that is, it, uh, uh, it's not now whether you want to tolerate it or not, or whether you actually care about the Bill of Rights or not, or whether you ever even heard of them before. Uh, bankruptcy brings it home to you at once. Right now, I mean, I offer you just one small statistic. Statistics are not things that are usually easily transmitted over television. Um, at, before the First World War, the British Empire had a, a trade surplus that was maybe, uh, its current account surplus was maybe 7% of GDP. They were an extremely rich country. Uh, they could afford to make mistakes, as in things like the Boer War and things like that. We have trade deficits that are the greatest in recorded economic history. Uh, they're running up to uh, uh, several percentage points, high percentage points of GDP. They're financed today, the fact that we consume so much more than we actually produce, and we consume it from the rest of the world, they're financed by savers around the world, usually people in East Asia, Japanese, Southeast Asians, Chinese, who uh, want to invest in our currency, since it has this imperial quality of being the global standard, want to invest in our currency as a safe haven. It's not that safe anymore, that the value of the euro against the dollar increases to the point that's right now, as I just I looked at it yesterday, 125 euros to the dollar, that's getting to be quite up there. I, I don't object, I, I mean, my royalties are paid in euros and I'm just utterly delighted. I, on the other hand, I would not like to travel to uh, Bologna or Milano right now. Uh, it would be awful to have to convert dollars into uh, euros in order to pay my hotel bill. Uh, if uh, the savers of the world should decide, and they could almost at any moment, at any moment, that the euro was a safer place to invest than the dollar because the American economy was mismanaged. And what might lead them to think that? Well, that the whole mutual fund industry is now up for grabs because of corruption at the top, and that we, uh, and that we're, uh, uh, the state of California, the, the public employees uh, pension fund, one of the largest on earth, is in the process of suing the New York Stock Exchange for corruption. Uh, should they decide to shift their funds to euros or to some other currency or just keep it themselves, the American Stock Exchange collapses, we have a howling recession, and the United States instantaneously has to, uh, to finance all of its external debts by domestic savings. To do that, the interest rates would have to go up to Jimmy Carter levels, 21, 22 percent. It would have to really be valuable to you in America to save money and lend it to the government, and you would insist that they pay you a great deal. Now, we're not talking about something abstract here. We're talking about the fact that we have uh, trade deficits that are running at, uh, at uh, 5 percent of GDP. And one of those things that we import a great deal of is petroleum, too. I mean, that, we pay that to Venezuelans and to, uh, and to Saudi Arabians and to Indonesians and, and others. The, uh, then you add to that, in November of 2003, the president signed a defense budget of $401 billion. This is the biggest ever done, and it doesn't include any of the money for Iraq. That's another $150 billion. This is, we are going deeply into serious deficits that must sooner or later be paid back or lead to a one and only time. You only do it once. You could denounce your debts. But then once you denounce your debts, you never get to borrow a nickel again in your life. Uh, you become uh, a pauper. Uh, the, uh, uh, that we have a allegedly fiscally conservative group of leaders who are anything but fiscally conservative. They are profligate about the, uh, the expending of, uh, of the wealth we have. Meanwhile, the country, as, we're, as workers in manufacturing discover, the country is turning into finance capitalism. What we do is we manipulate money these days. We don't manufacture very much stuff. We get it from somebody else. Uh, the, uh, or we have, our companies are manufacturing it in China or in uh, 
uh, Puebla, Mexico, or in uh, 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 Bangladesh, or, uh, uh, or in Malaysia, or certainly there's not a computer in the country that's made in the United States today. They're easily, most of them, made in Malaysia or in Taiwan. Um, when this happens, as uh, Herb Stein, uh, a Republican uh, uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, once said, things that, don't, that can't go on forever don't. Well, we are talking about something here that can't go on forever. And it's only now a matter of time. It's not a matter of a pundit sitting here and telling you that we are at a, a, a crossroads. That's the stock and trade of what pundits do. It is to say, this is something that can't go on forever. It will crack at some point. And there's a lot of people, very smart people, who know a lot about money, who are preparing for the crack. That is, when the United States is squeezed dry and can't pay anything more, the same thing happens, and it happens to you at Las Vegas when you announce to the uh, owner of the casino, I can't afford my debts. Uh, well, uh, you could find yourself planted in the, in the Las Vegas desert if you say that once too often. Uh, that's what we face. It is an almost certain uh, result of our militarism and imperialism because they don't produce anything. They are pure expenditure. They, well, what's they? Militarism, militarism and, 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 and imperialism are forever expanding, but they are not profit making. That the military is state socialism. It has absolutely, the military industrial complex has absolutely nothing to do with what we like in an almost sermon like way to talk about free enterprise. You have only one customer. Uh, the federal government is not concerned with getting its money's worth. It's concerned, the military is always concerned with effectiveness, whether you're getting the product that, that does what you want, want it to do, that is at best. The, uh, the missile defense budget right now, which is eight or nine billion dollars, I can't remember the exact amount, this is simply allocated by Congress and given to the Department of Defense, which then goes to see the manufacturers. Uh, uh, Teledyne and Boeing and uh, Lockheed Martin, and they then sit down and decide how they might spend it, what might be a good way to spend it. But it's not allocated funds. The Constitution requires that the citizens be given in a, I can't remember the quote exactly to you, but be given an honest accounting of how their tax dollars are spent on a regular basis. This clause is the clause that makes the United States a democracy because it says it makes the separation of powers work. It means that the people, through their representatives, can find out what the executive branch is doing. That has not existed in the United States since World War II. That is, the uh, Manhattan Project that built the atom bombs was, and remains to this day, totally secret. Uh, the, uh, and that's when the precedent began of all the intelligence budgets and anything you want to bury being put into the defense budget and kept black, so-called. Uh, and, and, and it was thoroughly black until after Watergate when we began to create committees that senior and safe senators would be given a peek at this stuff. But there are cutouts still in every one of those things. So the Department of Secretary of Defense can, if necessary, declare this simply black and it's a matter of national security and there's no way to appeal it. No court has anything to say about it. It's simply done by uniformed officers inside that big building uh, in Arlington. Um, under these circumstances, I think it is more than likely that the American empire will come, uh, that its, its, its uh, dismemberment, its uh, unraveling, will begin as a result of an economic crisis, rather than over any of the things that actually concern me more, the, the uh, perpetual war, loss of civil liberties, uh, a culture of, of lying and propaganda in official statements of the government. Uh, and that uh, there I don't believe I'm in any way alone. I think it's the collected wisdom of virtually every economist in the country that we are treading on extremely thin ice uh, economically uh, and that uh, one doesn't see any signs of recovery soon. People talk about civil society, yeah. business, and government being the three main players, the three stools of the 
global, I mean, the three legs yeah. of the global stool. But it's, it seems to me that the military community, so-called, yeah. not the establishment, yeah. yeah, the establishment that transcends borders, you know, yeah, that absolutely. have links between all themselves, the so-called intelligence community, same yeah. thing, the inter and then organized crime. Yeah. are equal, if not even more important players and more important legs to the stool. Would you comment well, This is what I'm trying to get at in The Sorrows of Empire, is the professional military, organized crime, and, uh, and the intelligence community. Which again, intelligence community, one of the odd things about that, I talk about it at good length in my book since I was at one time a consultant to the old Office of National Estimates of the CIA, and do know actually something about it, Intelligence organizations don't do intelligence. They're private armies of executives. That's the clandestine side of things dominates. It wags, the tail wags the dog in, in uh, the CIA. That is, the intelligence is worthless, as we now know in numerous cases, but that doesn't for a moment stop the funds flowing there. And that trails off and intersects quite easily with the world of organized crime in that the methods of clandestine activities, of overthrow of governments, of uh, provocateurs in which you incite people to riot, have your own snipers kill a few of them, and then say that innocent bystanders were killed by the government you want overthrown. We've used that ploy so many times, from Jakarta to uh, Caracas just recently, uh, that it's almost insane to believe that you could see, uh, you know, Dan Rather putting it out once again that innocent bystanders were, were shot by thugs of the, uh, of the Chavez regime, uh, which he said, you know, in, the, in uh, uh, just last year, when it's uh, standard operating procedure in overthrowing a place like uh, Salvador Allende in, uh, in uh, Chile in 1973 or things of this sort, uh, as well as, of course, even as we know in the case of John Kennedy and his animosity against Fidel Castro, the actual use of known mobsters in the attempt, in proposed assassination attempts. Again, the purpose here not being to avoid the onus of assassination, but to avoid the onus of pulling the trigger yourself. It is, a, it is also another standard American ploy is to have the CIA up with a, uh, a, uh, a complicit military organization in which they're giving the orders, but the other people are doing it. This is, for example, you'll recall uh, just a couple of years ago, the shooting down of an airplane over Peru that was filled full of American Baptist missionaries uh, that was interdicted by a uh, CIA control plane that sent in the Peruvian Air Force to shoot it down. Well, that's very similar to the Phoenix program throughout the Vietnam War, where we killed thousands of people uh, in, in similar sorts of ways. So that the other thing that I think is dangerous in all of this is the, uh, to just put in a, to remind people once again of one of the greatest scandals in the country, and that's something called the uh, School of the Americas, located on the base of Fort Benning, Georgia, in which we have for now decades trained thousands of thugs in state terrorism throughout Latin America. I strongly recommend to all of your viewers to look up the brilliant School of the Americas Watch, www.soaw.com. And well, there you can also look up any name of a Latin American leader, Mr. Montesinos, say, recently uh, deposed in uh, Peru, and find out that he not only taught at the School of Americas, he taught there twice. He was so good he was invited back uh, on uh, uh, how to, uh, to basically produce state terrorism in places like Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador uh, during the 1980s. Uh, so that uh, one begins to wonder what is left for organized crime. Uh, since uh, we're, we're, we've taken it over with arms sales, uh, with uh, the intimidation of population, oh, it is the protection racket. I mean, used to be, that is, the Ch Chicago mobsters used to uh, basically say, we're going to, you've got to pay us to be protected. Protected from whom? From us. Well, that's very largely what uh, America's uh, uh, operations today in uh, about 130 of 170 countries in the United Nations amount to, is the protection racket. And remember what 
the citizens of these countries see of the United States are uniform special forces troops, not State Department officials, not AID officials, not even businessmen. The ones they run into most commonly and inevitably, as a matter of elementary logic, have to conclude the Americans think in terms of enforcing their policies not through diplomacy, not through persuasion, but through the use of military force. That is, that's, uh, that's what you see of the United States today. That's in a certain sense what one again means by blowback, the disjunction between what we think we're doing in the world and what people on the receiving end know that we are actually doing and the kinds of attitudes that they generate. I'm sorry to say, but it is true. I think today the demise of the American empire would be no more regretted in the world than was the demise of the Soviet empire, which was not regretted anywhere.